One of the things that has affected me um, in my faith since doing a study, uh, a lesson series there in uh, Westworth Church of Christ down in Fort Worth was when I did a series over Deuteronomy. And there was a chapter and verse that just really affected me. It's Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 31. I just want to briefly read that. I'll back up to verse 30. The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until you reached that place. This idea of God, the Father, carrying us. You know, one of my favorite uh, songs, actually one of our family's favorite musicals, is The Greatest Showman with Hugh Jackman in it. And um, several weeks ago, our family, every once in a while, we listen to songs and they get stuck in our head. You ever get songs that get stuck in your head and it just keeps going? And so I'm taking Vivian to school one morning. It's just her and I, just the two of us. And uh, she's back there sitting right behind me, and she just starts blasting her pipes. Because every night I lie in bed, the brightest colors fill my head. A million dreams are keeping me awake. And I'm like, oh, she knows the words. That's beautiful. Because every night I lie in bed, the brightest colors fill my head. A million dreams are keeping me awake. Because every night I lie in bed, the brightest colors fill my head. A million dreams are keeping me awake. It just kept on going, and the same tune was sang every single time in a constant loop. And I, I took the mirror, and I looked back there. She didn't know I was looking. She didn't know I was listening. She didn't want me to sing along. She was just in the moment singing what she knew over and over and over again. And it was repetitious and beautiful. Why was she doing that? I wonder if you have ever been doing something uh, like working, working in the garden, or uh, working under a sink, or ladies doing some crafts, men doing some crafts. I know some of y'all do crafts. Or cooking. I love to cook and I'll sing. I wonder if you've ever done that and you just start singing, you start whistling. You don't even realize you're doing it until somebody points it out and you're like, oh yeah, I guess I was. I remember several years ago, I was working at a, a jet engine refurbishment plant in Wichita Falls. And there's all this sound everywhere, so loud. I was working with uh, an OSHA compliance officer there. And I'm walking down the hallway. I'm about 19 years old. And I start to sing Because He Lives. Beautiful song. And as I'm going through the first verse, as I'm singing this song, I started to cry. Not because it was a beautiful voice, by no means is it, but because it was in that moment. I realized for the first time as I sang that song that I believed Jesus died for me and that God did it because he loved me. Right then, I can point to that moment in my life. That's the moment that I believed it with all, every fiber of my being. Now, I share this with you, and I wonder if you've ever done this also. Just started singing, start whistling. And the reason I think you start to do that in those moments is because you're kind of at ease in that moment. You're kind of comfortable in that moment, as Vivian was comfortable in the car with her father driving, or as I was comfortable in that moment in my relationship with Christ as it just exploded in my heart. We start to have this thing affect us. This faith starts to affect us. We start to have a certain level of confidence. As that song we just sang says, we start to have a blessed assurance which starts to carry us through this life. And it's my hope today that since it's the day before 4th of July, a day when we celebrate the independence of our country, knowing all the problems going on in our country, they're not just a few that we make sure to put our faith in something 
that we know will last. A father who carries us through the wilderness. I am a citizen of the United States, and I love the things that it has stood for in the past, but I am not a citizen of the United States over a citizen of the kingdom of God. And we need to remember that. Last week I spoke to you about the hope that is in us and how we should have an answer. And I based that largely on the lesson that I gave to the kids at Summer Excitement. And, and we ended that class in Summer Excitement with the kids constructing their testimony about the hope that is in them. And they took it to the corner of the room and their TLC who was over them took a stamp and we put wax on that letter and they sealed it with the cross. And every single time, just about every single time when that seal was done, those kids had never seen that. You know what they said? Wow. They'd never seen that. And now they walked out of the class with that. Now, why did I do that? It's because I wanted them to walk out knowing that the Lord God who gave his son Jesus gave him for them. And they can rest assured in their faith that God loves them through thick and thin, and that that testimony is secured in Christ. If you've got your Bibles, open up with me to Ephesians chapter 1. That's where we're doing the primary part of our study. We will not stay here. We will hop around in a few places. You'll see why here in a moment. Um, in Ephesians... Chapter 1, and I challenge you to read verses 3 through 14 on your own. We won't read all that. It's a beautiful bit of poetic thought that Paul shares with the Ephesians. And he's essentially telling them, as you'll see, you are secure like we apostles are secure in God's will. Let's start reading here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 through 14. You can break it up in two parts. The two, first two verses are talking about the apostles. The second two verses are talking about the Ephesians. In him we were also chosen, us apostles were also chosen in Christ, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Now, when you think about that and you look over what he just wrote, it's pretty amazing to me what he's saying. Look at all the ways he's attributing uh, uh, responsibility to God. He says, we were chosen, we were predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with his purpose of his will and order. We are organized in such a way that we, okay, being the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. It's like he's saying that it's not us apostles that did this. We didn't choose to do this. We didn't plan this. This is something that God is behind. And what I love is he ends it with that phrase, for the praise of his glory. Now, we just had a wonderful session just now of praising God for his glory. And how do we do that? We do that in song form, right? We sing praise to God's glory. Um, I remember as a kid watching Star Wars, and, and when one of these characters might pop up, let's say Luke Skywalker. I don't know if you knew this. Some of you all may not know this, but Luke Skywalker's got his own theme song. Okay, Leia, she's got her own theme song. Okay, and, and this, uh, yeah, I know my wife's laughing. She's like, she's such a geek. Okay, Obi-Wan Kenobi has his own theme song. Han Solo has his own theme song. All these people have their own th theme songs. One of the things we love is our own theme song. We like to be our own person. We like to be independent. And what Paul is saying is all of us have been put in such a place by God that it's not our theme song we sing, it's his. His theme song. We are the song of his glory. It's almost as if God is constructing this beautiful orchestral uh, uh, musical piece. And it's like he's saying all the notes are set. God put them this way. And we are those notes. You can't change those. You shouldn't want to change those. You are in there. 
You're part of his wonderful song. And he goes on to say, verse 13, And you, Ephesians, also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You were included in that song, in that praise of his glory. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. You believed, you were put in him, and you have the Spirit, which is guaranteeing that you will receive that inheritance. Dash, look what it says, to the praise of his glory. Like his apostles, you are also now part of God's theme song. Now, it is my belief that Paul writes this to the Ephesians because he wants them to realize they are secure. And it's my belief that you and I need to understand Paul would also want us to know that we are secured in our faith. Well, I told you about summer excitement and how we did this seal, and I want to I'll talk about that today, kind of like a word study. What does it mean to be sealed? You know, on your uh, bulletin, you have a little letter there with the seal. That's the way we might do it today if we had that. That's how we did it for the students uh, a week and a half ago. But seals were used for all kinds of purposes, and I would like to look at a few scriptures that deal with seals in the Bible so you can understand what Paul is trying to say about you and I. I'm going to do these out of order. I've decided to do A, you're secured last. So let's start with the fact that you are authenticated. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 21. We have in this story a guy by the name of Naboth. And there's this evil, wicked king who wants his vineyard. And Naboth says, no way, man. And so Ahab goes and talks to his wife Jezebel, evil lady. And this is what she does. We are in verse 8. So she, Jezebel, wrote letters in Ahab's name. Look what happened. Placed his seal on them and sent them to the elders and the nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. In those letters she wrote, Proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people, but seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them bring charges that he has cursed both, of the, both God and the king, then take him out and stone him to death. Well, that's not very nice, is it? <laughs> now, when she puts Ahab's seal, did Ahab put the seal or did she? Well, she put it on there. But when they receive those letters, they see the seal, and who do they know put the seal on? Ahab. He was the one that okayed it. The idea is that that, that seal proclaims who sent them. Right? They read it. They see the symbol, and they're like, that's Ahab's. I know it's from Ahab. Um, the Holy Spirit, which we receive when we believe, seals you so that you as a people can be seen as belonging to God. All right? It is something that people can read in a way. Uh, one of the things I've noticed is, uh, and, and I will say that I was affected by this in my younger days, um, I've noticed that Christians are very apprehensive when they are asked to give some type of opinion on anything in our culture. Um, it might be on the subject of homosexuality or on the subject of adultery or on whatever the subject is. But there's a sense of apprehension. And when we look and see how people often respond, they usually say, rather than answering the question, well, Christ says, love God with every fiber of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's good. Occasionally, that is used as hopefully a, something that is given so that the people will automatically turn around and walk away and say, okay, well, whatever. They don't want to answer that. Sometimes people do that in an effort to continue to look good in a culture. 
I want to read to you Galatians chapter 5. This is what Paul says about the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. In other words, a kid who saw them would know immediately that they are acts of the flesh or that they're not right. In fact, we often, we have to teach the culture into our children and replace the moral understandings of things with that culture. And so we see that the acts of the flesh are obvious. He says, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He lists all these things. He says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty straightforward. Will not inherit the kingdom of God. If we look back at Ephesians chapter 1 where we're just at, he says that if we have sealed, been sealed in the Holy Spirit, there's a deposit guaranteeing that we will receive the inheritance, Right? He continues, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. What's the point? If we have been sealed in the Holy Spirit... Aren't we supposed to act like it? Aren't we supposed to behave like it? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit changes us and sanctifies us. We leave behind our old lives and the Holy Spirit continually changes us over time. I'm not perfect. We all sin. We need the Spirit to continue to do this and that is part of what that does is it is it slowly sanctifies us over time and it shows authenticity. It authenticates us and shows, hey, the author of this person is not Nathan. It's not Lyndon. Okay? It's Jesus Christ. Now, we also see that the seal does something else. Turn with me to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 10. He buys some property. Okay, he goes and he buys some property. Jeremiah does. It says, I signed and sealed the deed, had it witnessed, and weighed out the silver on the scales. I took the deed of purchase, the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, as well as the unsealed one, and I gave this deed to Baruch, son of Neriah. So what's this seal being used for? Purchasing. Did you know that if you've received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's moving in you and changing you, that that is not only saying that you are secured, that's not only saying that there is, uh, um, that you have been uh, purchased, but it says that you are owned. If you think about that for a moment, this seal shows that, that Jeremiah bought land, but the Holy Spirit shows that God has purchased you. Christ paid, you believe, you receive the Holy Spirit as evidence of that purchase. Okay, and he also owns you. Fourth and finally, we did two back to back. Fourth and finally, you are secured. Daniel chapter 6, verse 17 you remember when Daniel is put in the lion's den, right? The king comes up with all his nobles and he puts this ring signet and he puts the seal on this stone door. You know, you probably remember who else that may have happened to. Jesus. When he died, he was buried and Pilate had a seal put on place. What does that show? It shows that that place was secured that it should not be removed, that it should not be changed. When we are in the Holy Spirit, when we have been bought by Christ and we have faith in that, we are secured. 
One of my favorite scriptures that David writes in Psalms is this, 103, 12. He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. No matter the things that you have done, if you are in Christ, your sins are separated from you. Or Romans 8, 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What kind of faith does that produce? When we realize that we have been sealed, that we have been secured, and we have been bought, that we are owned, what kind of faith does that produce? Well, a couple chapters before Daniel is thrown in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego tell the king, if we are thrown in the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of God, gold you have set up. Even to the point of death. If you are a Christian... Paul says that you are part of God's theme song and you should be assured in your faith that Christ bought you, that he owns you, that he has authority over you and that he has secured you. So tomorrow, July 4th, is something we celebrate and um, some of the younger kids may not know, but it's basically we're celebrating what happened 1776, July 4th. The Second Continental Congress unanimously declared independence. Thirteen colonies that came together and regarded themselves as sovereign, no longer under British rule. And I don't know if you've ever read it, but they present 27 complaints to the British crown about why they're doing this. Did you know it wasn't signed at that point? It wasn't signed till almost a month later. 56 signatures. This morning, I put on my tie. I heard a lot of compliments about the tie. Thank you. And I looked at it this morning. I chose it last night, but I looked at it this morning and I saw the flag that has been shot to pieces. And underneath it, it says, gave proof through the night. Even after all the war and battle, the United States flag was still there. And I was overcome with a sense of patriotism. I was like, oh man, that's great. And then I read the bottom three words, or four words, in God we trust. And all of a sudden, I felt a bit of grief and sadness. Do you know how many people have given their lives in the United States in battle, died, for us to have independence? 1,217,656. That's from the Department of Defense. That includes World War II, World War I, all the little skirmishes in between ever since the Declaration of Independence was signed. That's a lot, isn't it? A lot of deaths. That's a lot of sacrifice, wouldn't you say? That's a lot of sacrifice so that we could have liberty. And as I read those words, in God we trust, I could not help but think that half this country does not trust in God. The Jews had a lot of sacrifices of animals, but it was not sufficient. Jesus Christ is sufficient. And July 4th, tomorrow, as you celebrate that, I hope you do not forget that while we have 1.2 million deaths for your liberty, that is not the liberty that lasts Anna Street. That's earthly. 
The one death, Jesus Christ, died so that all who believe in him would have liberty from their sin and would have eternal life and would have a king. It's important for us to understand that our song, though it's pretty, is not the Star Spangled Banner. Our song is the one that sings the glory of God in all that he has done. And we do that through the assurance of our faith, through how we behave in this world, through how we shine the light of Jesus as his workmanship. As our Father carries us through this wilderness to our destination, 